Hi, Manny. Hey, Paul. <laughs> I have a hot cup of tea. I have a jammy dodger. And I'm ready to just sit back, relax, and learn about the brain. All I got is a tall glass of water. Oh, a glass of water. Well, you, that's important. You'd be well, well hydrated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was straight till you brought the cookie into the competition. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so we're going to talk five different times about five different parts of the brain that, that we think we'll kind of come back to over and over again as we do what we do. And that's what we're doing with people this week. We're having like brain stuff. Yeah. Can you tell, folks, can you tell who the cognitive neuroscientist is and who the hypnotist is? We're going to talk about brain stuff. With but it's true, so it's good. <laughs> it's good. Today, um, I actually am really excited about this today, though. Well, I'm excited about all of it, but um, I think this is a great place to start because so much of the work that I do with people is about helping people overcome their fears, their fears yeah. of failing, their fears of not being good enough, whatever. All the time, I'm dealing with people about fear, and fear is living in the amygdala, yes? Yep, yep, the amygdala right. modulates the fear. We're going to um, talk about the amygdala today. Yes, cool. sir, let's do it. Now, I want to throw one thing in there quickly before we start. The key is to not get bogged down in parts because a lot of times people, when you – uh, hit a parts-based approach, they uh, kind of get trapped in thinking, this part does this, this part does this. And you don't really want to do that with your thinking. You want to think in terms of uh, the parts work together to get results. So your amygdala, to jump off to another part just to give context, your amygdala works can be uh, modulated by your frontal, your prefrontal cortex can be like calm down, chill out, chill out, you know. So yeah. the circuitry is what does a lot of it, but when we say one part kind of is responsible for something, just know that that's the part that's most activated during those type of contexts, those type of situations. So, okay. so with that aside, just a general picture. The amygdala is uh, associated with, uh, it's most activated during fear-based learning. So that's it, and that's the main thing to remember. <laughs> It's that simple. When you hear amygdala, think in a fear-based situation. If you take someone's amygdala out and they survive, like they they fail to learn fear-based stuff. When the amygdala over-responds, sometimes people have amygdala seizures, you'll get the type of situation where the amygdala will override um, the frontal lobe so, so that the hippocampus doesn't work as well. Now, I've gone into three different parts, but... All right, yeah, yeah, quick. So technically... Um, are there two amygdalas? Because there's like one on each hemisphere, yeah. right? Yeah, two almond-shaped uh, parts. Yeah, and they and they connect. It looks in the pictures that I've looked at in the past. It looks like they connect right to the hippocampus. Yeah, the, the hippocampus is sort of like a ram's horn, almost a little bit. Yeah, they like to and pretend it looks like right a signal. Yeah. <laughs> so if they're in two separate, if they're in two separate hemispheres. Do they work independently? Um, I never thought about that. <laughs> That's why I'm here to ask crazy questions. I never thought about that. Um, there, it, there is some asymmetry in, in the brain, so I'd have to dig more and tell you whether there's sort of an independent response. I never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious about that now because you do have different parts of your brain that, uh, are kind of dominant in different forms of thinking. So you would think that if the amygdala was interfering, like in your left versus right hippocampus, there might be some differences. So the amygdala is there, and it is a physical structure. Mm -hmm. And and so like you 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 keep saying fear, and you use the word learning with it over and over again. Um. So like let's say fear is activated for me. Mm -hmm. What liter literally happens in my amygdala? Okay, let me, uh, I'll give you a dichotomy, and this will probably go a little bit deeper than most people want around dinner time or lunch time. <laughs> but um, by and large, you have, you can think of the amygdala as the lizard brain. You have your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your 
brain that has allowed you to move away from stimulus action, stimulus action, okay? Your okay. prefrontal cortex kind of jumps in there and says stimulus, and then it might, you know, retrieve some memories and be like, well, let's see, last time this or this happened, so let's do this. Now, when you scare the poop out of someone, there's not, no, there's no real um, deep thinking involved. It's holy crap, more poop metaphors. But <laughs> so it's that speedy reaction. The more scared you are, the more activated the amygdala is, the less prefrontal cortex activity is going on to the point where if you traumatize someone, if you scare them enough, you don't get any prefrontal activity. Now, they say the prefrontal lobe uh, mod modulates the amygdala, so what you want to think is that it modulates the amygdala so that the amygdala doesn't interfere with um, the hippocampus encoding what are called uh, episodic memories, like memories that narrative autobiographical memory. So if you scare someone deeply enough, they'll get like PTSD, dissociative symptoms. They'll, their body will remember the fear, but they won't have the narrative of the fear, so they won't be able to bring the fear to consciousness as a memory to kind of contextualize it. It'll just be like they're just triggered. Like, like um, the first example I think of is like um, if you have a tire backfire, and someone, and this is sort of a caricature of an example, so I don't really like to use it that much, but it makes the point. Um, if someone has PTSD from war and you have a tire backfire, that sound might trigger all of the fear-related responses. Now, if the fear had been encoded in your hippocampus effectively, you would realize that, oh, this is a memory, I'm afraid, and it's giving me a flashback. Um, and I don't even want to use the word flashback there because in a clinical context is different. It'll give me sort of a memory that I'm aware is a memory. Now, if your hippocampus, if you got scared so badly that your hippocampus didn't encode it, then you might have, you don't get tagging in your hippocampus, which means the memory doesn't feel like a memory. The memory, you get that present right now, like it's hard to tell you experience it again, sort of superimposed in the reality. Yeah. So I want to, um, I want to just put this up real quick, so so we'll, uh, just so people, because I know some people like visual stuff. Yeah. So so um, the the red parts in this image, I'll see if I can make it bigger. Um, the red parts are the amygdala. Yes. Yeah, but if you looked at it head on, they look more like little almonds. Yeah. Yep. And then the blue part running directly back off the amygdala is the hippocampus? Yep, those are your seahorses, supposedly. Ah. Yeah, uh, someone claims they look like seahorses. Uh, okay. That's what the uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so this, I, I think um, this is a great example of, of what you kind of cautioned us about at the beginning is, so we have this very simple image of the brain overall with two particular parts highlighted, and what you're talking about right away is the idea that they have to work in concert with each other, right? Like the amygdala, um, whether is when it's activated, when, when you say encoded, you mean like stuff is happening at, at the at the chemical and cellular level that's making yeah. memory. Electrochemical, yeah. Okay, right? So it's no mistake, I would think, in the divine evolution of the brain that the that the amygdala is literally connected on the tip of the part of your brain that makes memories. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's got to be a kind of evolutionarily prerogative to help you survive. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty convenient that when I get scared, I remember memories get made to help me avoid get this thing yeah. that got me scared. Right. Yeah. And memories, and you got to remember the other half of uh, um, encoding memories is retrieving memories as well yeah right if you want to retrieve memories super quick because you're scared now remember when I say memory I mean motor memory everything that you experience and recognize is a memory okay, okay? if you if you have like uh, a flashback and think about something that's a memory if you're moving your hand in a way that is anything other than a seizure that's muscle memory okay Okay, everything that is not 
strange. Like perception is a series of memories that are kind of overlaid on your interaction with the world. And a lot of people kind of don't think about that that way, but all of it. If you smell something and you're like, it smells like popcorn, it's because you've done a comparison of prior popcorn memories. You're experiencing more right. memory than you're right. experiencing popcorn because otherwise it would just be a smell. Right. Okay. All right. So, I mean, that's really it today, right? Because we're going to try to start this simple and build on it over time. Yeah, man. So we've got, now we have, for folks who have watched this, they have a sort of sense of where the amygdala is located and, and you've helped them understand what it's responsible for and how it works in concert with other things, right? Yep. Is there any other, like, last thing that you wanted to cover today about the amygdala that you haven't got a chance to yet? Meditation uh, helps you chill out your amygdala. Oh. Now I want to go there, but that could be another whole 20-minute conversation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we could, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it later. We'll come back to that because what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to do five videos about um, some – some parts that we think are important to talk about because we're probably going to talk about them over and over again as we um, talk about the things that Manny and I talk about. Then we're going to talk about um, things like uh, modulators, the more chemical side, electrical side in the following week. Um, and then in the final week, we're going to talk about processes and how it all kind of comes together and how the actual processes of thinking and experiencing works. So stick with us because we're trying to build – uh, starting out simple, working toward a greater understanding. We're starting to uh, start with these simple, simpler parts, <laughs> and then get there. So, so that's uh, that's step one. We just talked about the amygdala. Yeah, man. What are we going to talk about next? We're going to talk about the prefrontal cortex, right? Let's go with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you guys come back and check it. Uh, check us out. Our next video is going to be about the, about the prefrontal cortex which is about self-control? Uh, executive function. Oh, that sounds fancy. I can't wait yeah, to talk about like, that. Like, All right, soup type stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Manny. Thanks, Paul. All right, we'll see you guys soon. Come back and check us out at Hypnotic Thoughts.